Thank you. Thank you very much. It's nice to be back at Albra on familiar territory. Um, this morning we saw several really engaging and, without any question, creative people. From the dark recesses of Thomas Dolby's mind, we were presented with a poco- apocalyptic world. Uh, Kathy Hind linked birds and, uh, and sound and mechanics and maps for us. Jennifer Stum um, gave us a very important lesson uh, that sometimes the best thing to be is a little bit wrong if you want to be right. And uh, Akala, thank goodness there's a break between a rapper and an academic. I, I was really, really relieved about that. Uh, astonished us with the, the links that he found. And none of them told us one thing, which was where their great ideas came from. And we should be pleased about that, because if they did, they wouldn't have sounded like the engaging, accomplished people that they are. They'd have sounded a little bit like morons. There's nothing more painstaking than listening to a creative artist or a creative scientist explain where their ideas came from. And the reason for that is that they don't know where their ideas come from. They emerge sometimes gradually. They have a little mental tip of the tongue phenomena for months. They know something is there. They're not quite sure what it is. And then it emerges. But they really have no insight, no feel for where that comes from. They might sometimes make things up and tell you that they do. But A, they're not very convincing. And B, they're probably wrong. And that's true of all these people who've in some way changed our lives, whether they've changed our lives with important scientific discoveries, with art, with music, with poetry. Um, None of them, and some of them have tried, none of them have been able to say where their creative um, juices spring from. And it's a feature of all accomplished creative people. Now, if we want to study this, we have to do two things. We have to do that scientific thing, which is take something huge and interesting in the world and be reductionist about it. We have to break it down into its component parts. But we do that not to minimize it or reduce it. We do it to understand it. And there are four main components of creativity in the research to date. One is preparation. None of these people, none of them, woke up one morning and had a good idea without putting years of obsession, years of deep thought, and sometimes a couple of marriages into the process of being obsessed about what it was they wanted to achieve. There's a long preparatory period. We do it ourselves, and I'll give you an example in a second of something that we all do that's been a long preparatory grind. Then there's an incubation period here in Albra and in this surrounding area. Probably lots of you buy The Guardian and The Telegraph at the weekend just to do both crosswords. And sometimes you sit there tapping the, the newspaper thinking, what is it, was it, it was it? And then you think, no, I'll go and have a cup of tea. You're putting the kettle on, that's when you get the answer. You get the answer when you're not thinking about it. You get that that answer after you've given your brain some downtime to do what it does, to do its processing. And that's a feature that we must engage with and that you must allow to happen if creativity is going to be part of your, um, uh, if you want to engage in a creative process. Then you have that illumination period, the ha-ha, where did that come from? Why didn't I see that before? How is it that I, I couldn't work that out logically? And then we test it sometimes in the cold light of day. If it's a crossword, then you know pretty quickly whether you were right or wrong. If it's a song or a scientific idea or a hypothesis, then the verification period is a lot longer. But today I just want to concentrate on the preparation, the incubation, and the illumination periods, not the verification. We have to do another thing in our reductionist paradigm, is we have to decide what creativity is. Now, we can't really get a group of people into a lab and say, Make a birdie piano-y thing, please, and uh, we'll decide how creative you are. Um, we, we, we can't get people into a laboratory and paint for us. I mean, this beautiful picture of a cornflower here recently sold for several, several thousand pounds. And I like it, and I hope some of you like it. Uh, but the chimpanzee who painted it didn't get any money for it. And, <laughs> and, and really, then, we can't decide whether it's a creative act or not. We just know that it's something that made a a lot of money. So we have to decide what is a a creative process or what is an insightful process. And this is what we do in the laboratory. This is what we've uh, converged on. All of us have spent years, decades, learning language. It's down there. It's a long preparatory period. And we've generated thousands upon thousands of, of original sentences. We're very creative with language. So let's see if we can bring into the laboratory Uh, the creative linguistic processes, and look at the brain states before you solve a problem. So, for example, if I were to say to you, find a word that links actor falling and dust, 
You could do this logically, or you could do it with insight. For some of you already, the word has come to your, to your mind, and so you know what it is. Others of you are thinking, actor, unemployed, falling, unemployed, dust, unemployed. No, it's not unemployed. That's not the word that links them. Then I say to you, broken, clear, or, or and I, and some of you immediately again will say, well, that's glass that links them. Others of you would have to say, uh, broken shoe, broken pencil, broken window, broken glass. And then you'd say glass, clear, glass, glass, eye. So there are two ways of solving problems. Um, linguistically or in any other way, either logically, which is slow and, and repetitive, or you have these insightful moments. But true creative moments usually come from these insightful uh, moments that people are not quite sure uh, about the origin of. So here's what happens in the laboratory. You take people into a laboratory, you wire them up with electrodes, and you record their brain states before they solve a problem. Not while they solve a problem, before they solve a problem. That turns out to be the important period. And then we give them the word tests, bump, egg, and, and step, or reverent, board, and, and hen. And you ask people, have you got the solution? Yes, I've got the solution. What's the solution? Thank you. That's correct. Now you ask people, did you solve that logically, or did, you, did the answer just come to you in a moment of insight? And it turns out that what happens in the brain before you're, you're presented with those words determines whether you will solve the problem by insight or by logic. So think about that. How you are going to solve a problem next depends on what your brain is doing slightly before that problem solving, not during that problem solving. So what is your brain doing? Your brain is oscillating. It's the only scientific term I will use today, um, which means that the neurons are firing at different frequencies. They're talking to, to each other at fixed frequencies. And these frequencies, which are not common in all brain states, um, I, I hope that none of you are in some of these brain states right now because they're associated with, uh, with reverie or with daydreaming or with relaxation or with actually switching your mind off, thinking of, of nothing. Um, and when we look at which brain areas are talking to each other or talking to their own local networks in these frequencies, what we see if you just look at the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, four of those, those brains, uh, the ones that are in green, what we see is that when we look at the, the, frequency, uh, the frequency ranges in the insight conditions, when people have said, yes, I solved that by insight, versus, yes, I solved that logically, and we look at the activity that was going on two seconds before they solved it, we see the language areas of the brain, we see the short-term memory areas of the brain, and we see some areas of the brain associated with imagination and association talking to each other at these fixed frequencies. Now, the reason you don't solve the crossword puzzle when you're tapping the paper with the pen, thinking, uh, trying to think of the clever answer, is that you're not allowing your brain to get into these states and to make new connections, to make new connections that you haven't made before. It's a small version of creativity. You've solved the crossword, but for you, you've made new connections. More uh, uh, wider and more consequential acts of creativity are making new connections that nobody else has ever made before. So your brain is in these oscillatory states when we are performing creative acts. And <laughs> although people are poor at explaining how they got an idea, they're very good at telling us when they got ideas. Um, Paul McCartney famously uh, woke up uh, with the melody of yesterday in his, uh, in his mind one morning. Kakula um, woke up uh, after dreaming about the ring structure of the benzene molecule. Uh, many people report that they have a creative idea to solve a problem when they're zoned out or just thinking about nothing in particular. They've done all that preparatory grind. They've learned the language. They've learned their chemistry. They've learned their music. Whatever it is, is their creative domain. They've learned about birds and wires, whatever it is. And, and now the brain is offline mulling over all that information. Just because you are not concentrating on it or you don't think you're concentrating on it doesn't mean that your brain is not trying to do something with that information. Other great times for um, uh, for creative insight are holidays. I used to come back from my holidays with notebooks full of new ideas for experiments. My, my wife wasn't very impressed that that's what I did on holiday, but because I didn't have to think about 
very um, about everyday detailed things, my brain had a lot of freedom to come up with, with new ideas. So please tell your bosses that you need a holiday if they really want you to be creative. And it's not a trivial suggestion. It's a, it's a, it's a real suggestion. Your brain needs downtime in order to come up with those new ideas. So, based on the scientific findings and based on some other findings that I, I haven't presented to you about personality characteristics or the characteristics of, uh, of creative people, what can you do to be uh, more creative? And it's something we try and teach students. Um, being educated isn't about getting the right answer to something. It's sometimes just about finding the right question to something. Uh, sometimes about finding uh, new ways of answering a question rather than the way that's on the, uh, the answer sheet. Here are some of the things we tell them. Remember, you've got to be obsessed. Being obsessed is a way of all the time refreshing this background activity that your brain is doing, uh, that your uh, brain needs in order to be, to be creative. And by being obsessed, you can actually make some of these processes a little bit, but not very much so, more explicit. But if you're not obsessed, you're not going to be creative in that domain. And if you talk to elites who are creative, if you talk to uh, uh, people like Thomas, you will find that they know a fake when they, when they meet one. They know somebody who's had a one-off idea. They know somebody who's not going to have another idea because they haven't got that bedrock of preparation behind them. You've got to allow that incubatory period uh, so that your brain can consolidate and, um, and, and make these new connections. Something that happens in, in sleep, during a slow wave phase of sleep, your brain is oscillating very, very slowly, around about 0.1 hertz. Um, and during that time, uh, you're actually replaying events of the day. And some of those events of the day get connected in new ways. And people uh, sometimes have improved memories after those periods of sleep. And some people actually have false memories after those periods of sleep. So those are the two things we need to do in order to put yourself in a position where you can have these creative insights. So the first thing is be prepared be obsessed. Think about some of these people here. Now, being obsessed doesn't mean that you choose to be obsessed. Uh, Anna Matava, the, the poet, she had no choice about her obsession. She was, she was forced into the situation she was, uh, she was put in. The obsession might be a competitive instinct that one has. Uh, the obsession might be something that you love doing, like Alan Turing's love of mathematics and computation from being a small boy. Or the obsession, like Steve Jobs, just might be that you know and sometimes are correct about thinking that you know better than everybody else and what they want. Uh, God bless him. I put a sportsman there. I don't know great beef about uh, either that football team or that, that, that player. Um, but sports is a, is a domain of creativity that we often underplay. Uh, and I think it deserves more, more recognition for the, for the creative acts because they are just as, as creative and, and, uh, and hard won as the, um, as the creation of a jazz musician, an improvising musician, for, for example. There's years and years of hours every day of effort gone into doing something sublime that's, that actually, unlike in a, in a jazz uh, band, people are actually trying to stop you doing. Uh, and, and sporting creativity is a really, really good, uh, good example of, of the creative process. You could, if you wanted to be more creative, come to my lab. Um, we, we, we have methods of brain stimulation there. It's the expertise of the lab, human brain stimulation. And we are now embarked on inducing these oscillatory activations into people's brains to try and make them solve problems in uh, different or better ways. Or, if you've got a lot of time to spare, you can come to my lab and you can spend the night and, uh, and you can sleep there. And uh, we'll wire up your brain and we'll induce slow wave oscillations into your brain while you're sleeping to try and improve your, your memory. Um, somebody already thinks that's a, a very good offer. You're welcome. You could, if, if, if having your brain stimulated uh, by me seems a bit drastic, you, you could try a, a tiny bit of brain damage. Um, Edward Mybridge, uh, I'm sure you all, uh, all recognize the kind of photograph. He became very famous when he solved the problem of whether um, all four uh, hooves of a horse leave the ground when they're galloping. That was the, the start of his, uh, his fame in, in, in North America. But prior to that, he was just about to become a failure. He was bankrupt. I can't remember if it was before or after this that he, he killed his, uh, his lover's husband. Um, uh, but then he had, a, he had a, an accident, he, a horse and carriage accident, and he had a severe, uh, severe damage to the frontal parts of his, his brain. And actually, this disinhibited him a little bit, Although if he had killed the person before, and he's probably quite disinhibited. But this disinhibited a little bit more. And um, um, 
uh, and also allowed his brain to, or forced his brain to operate with different circuitry. And from that time onwards, his ideas became better. Um, he, um, he really, really took off and, and made his fortune and became an important person in the early movie industry. And it's not uncommon, although it's still not a good reason to seek brain damage, it's not uncommon for people to, um, uh, to experience changes in the way they think and sometimes improve creativity after uh, some form of brain damage. Think of it as changing the circuitry. If the circuitry is different, then you're going to be thinking differently to other people. You could have bad hair. It seems a scientific fact that there's a period that everybody has to go through in which to be creative in which their hair is bad. If we look at Brian Eno or, or, or Bob Dylan or, or Einstein. Um, but the important thing is that, that, um, that underneath that hair is a very average brain. None of these people were young superstars. Uh, and, and a, a couple of them came very close to, to lifelong failure and, and, and mediocrity. There is no relationship between IQ and creativity. There's a much greater relationship between obsession and creativity. You don't have to be super smart to be super creative. Being a little crazy helps because if you're thinking about the world in a different way and you're trying to um, uh, come up with new things, then, of course, you will be... Uh, you will be um, uh, not connecting with people in, this, in, in their terms all the time. But only be a little crazy. Don't be, don't be entirely crazy. Always examine the things that you think you know. You all know what the Mona Lisa is, and some of you will know which one of these is the real Mona Lisa. But I could have put any single one of them up, and you would have all said, yes, that's the Mona Lisa. How well do you know the Mona Lisa? No better for me, because I'm not going to tell you which one it is. But examine what it is that you think you know. And dare to be simple. How often is it that a problem is solved and you think, why didn't I think of that before? And the reason is, is that when we are focused on a problem and we think we can solve it, we, th we try to be clever. We think there's a complicated solution. And often the solution is much simpler. And it's only our unconscious brains working offline that dare to make those, those connections. Be courageous. It's a little bit like being crazy. If you are thinking differently from other people, then people aren't always going to like it. And if you are trying something new, it can go disastrously, disastrously wrong. And be wrong. Each one of these people, Jobs, sacked by Apple, Ferguson, relegated, Linus Pauling, got DNA wrong, Fred Hoyle, beautiful but wrong theory about red light, uh, the red shift, Galileo, wrong about the speed of light, Simon Rattle, embraces being wrong. He's got a beautiful... Uh, interviewing Gramophone about the glories of being wrong. Be wrong. It's part of being creative. <coughs> and finally, relax. Creativity occurs offline. Put the hard work in and then relax. It will come if you let it. Now remember, we had egg, bump and step, reverence, board and hen. Could I just have a show of hands for people who solved the words that, uh, that linked those two things? Egg, bump and step. You did. Two of you did. Well, the rest of you then can relax a little bit more and be more, more creative because I'm not going to tell you what the answers are. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm.